Um, so first, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining this live Q&A session organized by the International Service for Human Rights for the launch of our new um, Civil Society Guide for Monitoring and Follow-up of China's Universal Periodic Review, or as we call it, um, the UPR. My name is Rafael Viana David. I'm the Asia Program Officer here at SHR, and I'll be leading today's um, Q&A session. So before um, starting today's session, I would like, of course, to express once again our um, deep appreciation for the support provided by many partners in this year-long project. Um, today's session will address um, two points. First, I would like to provide you with a little bit of context on um, what is the UPR, why is it important, um, and what came out of China's last um, UPR review in 2018. And then I will present this new guide, this new tool that we've prepared, how it's structured um, and what we were aiming for when we were producing it. Um, and we will provide a short um, summary of, of recommendations and going through the sections. And we will then have some time to address um, specific questions if there are any um, that you would like to raise now or that you have raised um, before. Um, let me first remind you some modalities for this session. So um, please use uh, your names or usernames uh, you have used to register if I've not done so already, so that we are all able to know who is joining us today. Um, you can also share questions at any time through the Q&A function, anonymously or with your name. We will then receive them here. Um, with the chat function, um, you can also, uh, you're also able to interact with us. Um, we will share in the chat the link to the online box, um, this online share folder, where you will be able to download the guides in all available languages, either in branded or anonymous versions. That is um, without ISHR's information or logo. And um, lastly, this session is being recorded and will be shared on ISHR website for any future purposes. Now, with no further ado, um, I would like to start. And I would like to start by uh, addressing a very um, elementary question, that is, um, what is UPR? So the UPR, you have, many of you ha will have already heard of it. Um, it's a process of review by which um, a government or a country presents its progress on all human rights to the international community and receives recommendations from other states for actions to take to improve its situation. It is periodic, that is, that it takes place every four to five years. Um, UPR recommendations are not legally binding. They're usually somewhat broad. Um, They're made by governments, not by independent human rights experts. Nevertheless, um, the UPR still has several advantages in comparison with the other UN human rights mechanisms that you might be used to um, engage with. The first is that, as the name says, it's universal. This means that it reviews the country's record on all human rights, regardless of the ratification of treaties or the recognition of certain rights by that country. In the case of China, for instance, this means that um, being able to review China's record on civil and political rights as they are enshrined in the International Covenant Civil and Political Rights, for instance, that China has not ratified yet. Um, being universal also means that it reviews all countries. So for this reason, although um, the recommendations coming out of the UPR can be seen as very political, it is overall perceived as a legitimate process because it does not single out any country in specific. Um, there are also many great opportunities for civil society engagement that we will be exploring a little bit further. Um, and all these elements make the UPR very useful for uh, several reasons. Um, and several purposes. The first one is to, of course, increase diplomatic or international pressure on a specific situation. Um, another one is to raise the visibility of specific human rights violations and also to open channels of dialogue with other countries that are involved um, in the review. All countries have undergone or are about to undergo their third UPR cycle. In theory, this means that um, it builds on the recommendations the country has already received in the first two cycles of the UPR. Each cycle is composed of several stages that many of you will be familiar with. Um, the first one, of course, is the preparation of all the pre-session documents and reports. This is where civil society and the UN prepare their own reports while the government prepares its own, um, which it's meant to do in an open and transparent consultation with um, national civil society. The state then undergoes its review where it presents its report and receives recommendations from other countries. 
It then has a couple of months to examine those recommendations and say uh, which ones it accepts, which one it thinks it is already implemented and which one it rejects. Um, the government sub submits this information to the UN in written form as uh, what we call an addendum um, to the report. The summary report of the review is then adopted during an interactive dialogue with the states and civil society at the next um, Human Rights Council session here in Geneva. Um, we then enter the crucial stage of national follow-up and implementation of the recommendations. Um, and this progress is often captured halfway through the cycle through what we call a midterm report, which is really the heart of this guide. Um, the presentation of a midterm report by the state is voluntary. It is considered a best practice by the UN. It aims at assessing the status of implementation of recommendations between two reviews. China does not present midterm reports, but this does not prevent civil society from doing so. And on the contrary, that's where it becomes even more important. During this cycle, there are um, several opportunities for participation of civil society groups and human rights defenders. So this goes from engaging with the government in the preparation of the state's report, um, sending UPR shadow reports that will be then reflected in the civil society report that um, the UN and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights prepares. This also means lobbying other states to issue specific recommendations to China or to any country under review. Um, engaging in the adoption of the UPR report during the council session, uh, engaging with the state in the implementation process, and of course, last but not least, using these recommendations to push for human rights change, monitor their implementation, and prepare a midterm report. Um, so this guide that we're presenting um, follows up on China's last UPR review in November 2018. Um, during this last review, China received 346 recommendations from 150 countries, and it accepted 284 of them um, and noted some as already implemented. Um, the others uh, were rejected, but you will realize that in English, in the UN reports, it is um, indicated as noted. This is UN language, of course, for rejected. But if you look at it in Chinese, it actually says rejected it in, in, in Mandarin. Um, I would like to share with you a little bit more information, uh, a little bit more information about the types of recommendations that um, China accepted and a little bit of a, of a breakdown of um, which recommendations were deemed as already implemented and others were deemed as not already implemented. And for this, uh, we're going to test a new um, tool that we have been developing here uh, for this webinar. So I don't know if you can already see it, but this is an infographic. Um, you might see on your screen an infographic of the a breakdown of the recommendations by issues. Um, so you can see uh, that many recommendations were issued on uh, economic, social and cultural rights um, or civil and political rights, and that uh, many of them are connected, for instance, with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, out of all these recommendations, um, China received and accepted many uh, that we deemed as friendly recommendations to continue to improve human rights in several fields, in particular on poverty alleviation. Um, it accepted all recommendations related, for instance, to gender discrimination and discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity, as well as those on the responsibility of Chinese companies operating overseas. Um, however, as many, you, uh, many of you will know, it also received a number of recommendations on many uh, on more contentious issues that, are, that were rejected, including on the ratification of international instruments, such as the, the ICCPR or the Rome Statute, the establishment of a national human rights um, institution, the repression against religious and ethnic minorities, in particular Uyghurs and Tibetans, um, the protection of the freedoms of expression, association and peaceful assembly, censorship online and offline, restrictions to NGOs and crackdown on human rights offenders and journalists. Um, some, of, some of the main areas for follow-up were highlighted in a letter that the, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Michel Bachelet, sent to the Foreign Minister of China in April 2019 that we can share with you here. So this letter was sent to the minister um, and it shared several areas of recommendations. Um, in particular, they were deemed as more urgent um, and that uh, in which, um, on which the government should be um, following up and implementing as soon as possible. 
Now, what happens next? Um, although it is not a, a hard deadline, it is expected that the midterm reporting phase should happen by May 2021. And then in 2022, China is meant to engage, uh, in theory, in national consultation to prepare its report, while NGOs can submit their reports by March uh, 2023, before the next, the next expected review in November 2023. So this date is very important to remember that it's tentative, given that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, UPR sessions have been delayed and will probably continue to be delayed or that some adjustments will need to be made. So what we try to do with this guide is really to put emphasis on how important it is to understand that UPR advocacy does not stop at the review stage. It is equally, if not more important, to make the most effective and strategic use of these recommendations uh, we have pushed so hard to, to get from this review. And in doing monitoring throughout the cycle and preparing a midterm report, we can then raise awareness of the outcome of the UPR and strengthen the transparency of the whole process um, and provide and use new tools for advocacy that is um, to push uh, actors and influence actors for positive human rights change. And this is why we prepared this guide, which I'll be sharing here a little bit more in details. Um, we really aimed to, to equip to provide the tools to civil society organizations and human rights defenders inside or outside of China to follow up on China's review and recommendations and to monitor their implementation. While there are already several fantastic resources on UPR participation out there, some of, some of which have been produced by some of you attending this event today, um, we still wanted to focus on the midterm reporting stage and we really wanted it to be action oriented so that those recommendations are actionable in our own advocacy strategies. We also wanted to ensure that the language was not a barrier. And for this reason, we're making this guide available in simplified and traditional Chinese for our colleagues and in Hong Kong, Macau, and possibly Taiwan, um, as well as in Tibetan and Uyghur languages. Um, lastly, to ensure that this benefits equally international advocates and China watchers, but also local activists inside the country, we are providing all versions in a non-branded format too, to mitigate the risks and facilitate local dissemination. So again, you are able to find all those different versions in the, in the box link that has been shared in the chat. So with this in mind, let's take a, a closer look at, at this um, UPR guide. So here you will have a table of content of all the different sections that we're going to be skimming through very briefly and then taking questions from the floor um, if you would like to have, um, if you would like to know a little bit more detail. Um, in section one of this guide, um, we aim to provide an overview of what comes after um, the UPR review and what can civil society organizations do in the five year period before the next review or in this case, a three-year period before 2023. This is particularly important as there are many other opportunities to reuse your UPR work in other UN human rights spaces in which some of you are already active. That includes the special procedures independent experts or the committees in charge of supervising the implementation of international human rights treaties or what we call the treaty bodies. Um, in a, the second section, uh, we explain why civil society participation is so crucial, in particular to make sure the UPR is not a platform for dialogue between states only, but that civil society voices and concerns are adequately heard and addressed. Um, in sections three to five, we try to unpack the key steps to develop a strategy for your monitoring and follow-up work that is as clear result-oriented, um, targeted, and effective as possible. As you may have realized, there are many areas to cover and we might feel a little bit overwhelmed given that we only have limited resources. So this is why it is crucial to ensure that we make a strategic use of our capacities and resources. So the first step here is scoping work. That is deciding on what to monitor and what to report on. Then comes um, the mapping of actors. Um, in this section four, it's particularly relevant because it encourages to think a lot outside of the box and reach out to beyond the traditional targets that we really we, we are used to engage with in our UN or human rights work. 
um, if you match the result of this actor mapping exercise with the work that you have scoped just before, this will allow you to prioritize a smaller set of recommendations that are more strategic to achieve your goal, given your capacity and your resources. Um, and once you've done this, um, you can then move to planning a timeline for action. Although the next review may seem very far away in 2023, um, it comes very fast and it's really important to plan ahead of time and start um, soon enough. And now that a clear strategy can be built from those steps, it's time to actually get to work. <laughs> in sections um, six and seven, we provide some tips to decide on what kind of information and evidence um, to collect for monitoring. An important consideration here is not to work alone, as, um, as you know very well, strengthens really in the collective work. Um, additionally, given the documented risks of reprisals for engaging with the UN, we also wanted to stress, uh, stress in this section how crucial it is to document and share this information in a safe manner and share some considerations on how to do this uh, in this specific context. Um, ISHR actually is in the process of creating an online platform for data collection and analysis, in particular in the context of the UPR, that we hope will be an important tool, although not the only one, uh, but still an important tool for your UPR monitoring and reporting work, both from inside China and from outside China. Um, finally, um, in the guide's last section, section eight, um, where we get down to business, uh, we use uh, the example of a good um, smart recommendation, what we call. So that means a recommendation that is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Um, and we use this recommendation as an example and walk you through the, the whole process um, of uh, strategy planning and planning for your uh, the implementation and from the midterm reporting. Um, lastly, we share some um, additional resources uh, and databases, both from the UN and other key NGOs, either China focused or not, um, for your consideration and to complement this guide and to complement the existing information that you have. In particular, the databases are very important when you are trying to compare and to connect what has happened at the UPR with other UN human rights mechanisms and the recommendations they may have given to the government in the past. Um, we finished this guide with uh, a series of, uh, of recommendations, a, select, uh, a selection of key recommendations that we organized by theme and indicated where they were rejected or not um, by China. So um, while these were already available in Simplified Chinese through UN translation, we thought it was important to ensure they were also available in other languages, um, which is why we have this selection and in all guides. And we organized them to make it easy to understand the key issues. So that includes, as you can see here on the screen, human rights defenders, um, lawyers and the rule of law, um, detentions, freedom of association and assembly, expression and digital rights, freedom of religious belief, cultural rights and the rights of minorities, non-discrimination and equality, labor rights, um, environment, business and human rights, um, economic, social and cultural rights, cooperation with the United Nations and Hong Kong. There are also specific sections um, on Uyghur regions and on Tibet for the guides in um, the relevant languages. So with all this, we sincerely hope that this will be a useful tool and then you can, of course, first use it, but also help us and disseminate it and reach out to us for any support that you, um, that you might need. We would be really interested in actually also having your feedback on this guide so that we make sure that we can uh, always improve our work and that you can share with us your midterm reports um, and your plans. So this was for the presentation part. Um, now I would like to, of course, open the floor um, for any questions or comments that you might have, and this will be done through the Q&A function. Uh, so I will leave you some time to ask your questions in the Q&A if there are any, um, but I will also like to already address some preliminary questions that we have received, um, and that might overlap with some of the concerns that uh, you might be having. So the first question that we have received um, is related to um, any examples of participation to the UPR from civil society organizations that are based in mainland China. So yes, 
Fortunately, um, several civil society organizations from the mainland still participate in the UPR process despite the risks. Um, some of them um, that operate um, in a less sensitive space, they have engaged using their name and they have been very cautious in the framing of their recommendations, of course. Um, others who are more targeted um, in their work, they have partnered with international organizations, for instance, or other um, individuals or groups that are in a safer environment to submit the information and to participate. Um, you might find all this information in China's UPR page on the website of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And there you will find a link to all reports submitted by civil society groups, which is also a very useful uh, resource and a way of dissemination, uh, of, dissemination of your findings. Um, however, it's also important to note that many of those reports might not come from independent civil society organizations, but rather from what we call gongos or government organized NGOs. So either representing, for instance, um, China mass organizations or organizations that are registered on their governmental bodies. And you will often see if you look through those reports that and they will have very similar arguments and language um, as the government and with limited to no concern or criticism expressed. So this is also to flag what you can find in all those reports and um, how to break down a little bit um, this participation by groups that are based in the mainland. Um, and the increasing presence of gongos, it's, it's also not noteworthy and it's an example of, of the importance of participation by independent civil society to ensure um, balanced and also evidence-based information. Um, another question that we have received um, relates to uh, the opportunity for civil society engagement with the Council and or the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on China's UPR reporting. So there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of opportunities. If we focus on the midterm reporting stage, there is not a formal opportunity as this is a voluntary stage for states to submit the reports. But that doesn't mean, and that should not prevent us from actually engaging at this stage. Um, this means that actually you have the flexibility as a civil society organization to use this moment of midterm reporting that is, that is recognized as such, although not necessarily with a formal process, um, but that it is recognized as important to raise the visibility of some specific issues or the work, uh, the documentation work that you have been doing and to advance uh, your agenda or and to push for implementation of specific goals. Now, as we saw also just before, um, in the proper UPR process, however, of course, there are several like formal um, avenues for participation, um, as we highlighted. So that includes, um, you know, again, engagement with the government, uh, preparing the state report, sending, of course, UPR shadow reports that are going to be all compiled um, in the civil society report, a unified report, let's call it, um, that is prepared by the, high, by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, engaging in the adoption of, of, of the UPR during the council session. So this is during an interactive dialogue. And for those of you that have experience in engaging with the council session, this is a normal um, council meeting. Um, with space for civil society participation and through oral statements. Um, and lastly, of course, um, but most importantly, uh, lobbying other states to issue specific recommendations that you have been working on and that, on, on which you have um, documented evidence um, and information. Um, so looking quickly at other questions, Yes, so we have a question about um, whether NGOs have encountered suppression of uh, their reports on China or blocking of their engagement at the Council. So first of all, um, there has been some concerns about UPR reports getting removed or not uploaded. Um, and these concerns were shared by Hong Kong groups from Hong Kong in the past. Um, in these cases, the UN applies its own assessment to criteria of what it calls non-politicization to try to ensure that organizations involved are quote unquote, legitimately working on human rights. Um, however, it's important to really maintain a constant um, and a direct dialogue with the relevant UN staff 
to, to ensure, to make sure that these criteria are not applied in, a, in an arbitrary and in a non-transparent fashion. Um, in terms of blocking of engagement, um, so it is also documented that China is one of the countries in the world with a systematic practice of intimidation and reprisals against those who seek to cooperate or cooperate with the UN. This is documented in a what we call the reprisals report. That is a report presented uh, on behalf of the Secretary General and presented by its Assistant Secretary General to the Human Rights Council. Um, so in addition to all the, the deterring effects of those practices of, of reprisals, uh, the government also uses a series of procedural tactics um, to try to avoid civil society participation in some spaces and, for instance, in the Human Rights Council. Um, this might include, and you might be familiar with this, um, points of order during NGO statements um, or letters to other states um, requesting them not to meet with, some, with certain civil society organizations. This has happened and this is also documented. Um, however, this does not necessarily happen at every session. And most importantly, there's um, an increasing pushback from civil society organizations and from states that are concerned against those practices. Um, so these are the questions so far that I can see, but I will leave again uh, one minute for any other um, questions that you might have um, that you can share through the Q&A. Um, also highlighting the fact that, of course, um, at ISHR, we're really pleased to be able to engage with you on this um, and that we are very open to receiving any other questions um, in, the, in, the upcoming, in the upcoming process. So I will leave um, the chat box open for a minute for any um, last questions and otherwise we can wrap up. So there is a uh, one question that were, was also sent um, before this, this, this Q&A session that was about um, what happens um, if the government rejects uh, a recommendation or it says um, it is uh, already implemented um, or that, is, um, that it is ongoing. Does this prevent us as civil society organizations from working on that specific recommendation? So, of course, no. It is really important to still engage, although perhaps in a different manner, but it's still engage all, all recommendations or opportunities for engagement. Um, if some recommendations were rejected, although the government, although this means that the government didn't necessarily commit to implementing those recommendations, from the other end, those recommendations were issued by a state. So this is a, a, a window for dialogue with the specific state that issued that recommendation um, to discuss with the state what are its next steps? What will it do to keep on pushing for the implementation of this recommendation or um, the specific area, um, this specific area of, of concern? This might mean through the UPR, but this might mean also outside of the scope of the UPR. So either in multilateral um, spaces at the UN, or through bilateral dialogues or other exchanges. Um, this is also a very important moment for you to highlight the difference between what the government says it is doing, since often when it rejects, this, uh, rejects it, it says that it's already been, um, that it has already been done or that it's not relevant. And when it says that uh, this recommendation um, is already implemented, in, uh, you might uh, think differently. So it is important to highlight the difference of what the government is doing um, and what you have documented in your own analysis. Um, it's also um, pretty important to point out to inconsistencies in data um, or where information and statistics um, are missing. 
Um, I will leave just a couple more seconds for questions and um, receiving one last one here. So there is a question here um, about the expectation for the NGO briefing um, and the participation of civil society. So the next formal, um, the next formal step where civil society will be able to participate formally, of course, will be um, the next the next review um, in terms of formal engagement. So again, this doesn't mean that the midterm phase is a very important phase, but there is not a formal mechanism for civil society engagement. However, in the next, um, in the next UPR review, um, it will be able, of course, um, to join um, the discussions online or offline. Um, this will depend on the situation. So, of course, right now, a lot of uh, meetings here at the UN are held virtually, and this is an expectation for the very beginning of next year, too. Um, but in any case, in this, um, in the, in everything that happens, in the council here in Geneva, um, there are two moments. The first one is the moment of the review in itself. So this is when, again, the state presents its report and its, uh, let's say, its record, and um, other states give their recommendations. Civil society is able to um, view this, is able to join online and see what is happening. And it's also a very important moment um, not to just be um, watching, but also actively monitoring fact-checking what has been done. It is a moment of important, of, uh, important visibility for the situation. Um, and a couple of months after, in the next council session, the Human Rights Council session, um, once we have the final report with the recommendations and the, the state's addendum where it says which recommendations it accepts or it rejects, um, all this um, is, let's say, combined and a, a final um, UPR report is presented at the council session in, an inter in this interactive dialogue. And, and during the presentation, this is when, as in the other interactive dialogue during the Human Rights Council session, states are able, um, limited number of states are able to um, present oral statements, to engage um, with the government, ask any questions, and there's a space for civil society. So this is a moment when civil society will be able to actively join um, this process. Now, of course, we still have a question mark as to by then will this participation will only be dealt uh, with online or, uh, or offline. And I think this is a question that unfortunately right now we can't necessarily respond because this will also be contingent on evolutions and, and, and changes in the modes of and modalities of participation um, to the Human Rights Council overall, because the UPR is part, is a mechanism that is um, part of the Human Rights Council. So this is on one question. Um, now I think we have another question. So we have a very good question here um, that it says that UPR is supposed to be cooperative, um, but China is not really good at cooperating with the UN, and we don't think there is a chance that they will uh, really make changes, even if they accepted them. Why should we keep on using the UPR then? Well, first, because um, there are some success stories, um, and this is really important to, to highlight. Um, if you look through the guide, we have shared uh, very succinctly some um, positive experiences, uh, the experience of other um, organizations or activists that have engaged in the UPR. And for instance, we have heard from um, LGBTI activists that have engaged in this process that this has, happened, this has opened some windows um, for a dialogue with the authorities 
um, as again, the um, recommendations that were accepted by the government, um, the recommendations on LGBTI issues and non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity were accepted by the government. Some of them were actually marked as either being currently being implemented or already implemented. So um, this makes the recommendations a little bit less sensitive and this creates, uh, this opens the dialogue to discuss with the government and ask, the, ask questions about, well, you're saying that you're implementing this or you have already implemented, we would like to know more and we would like to assist you in doing this. So the acceptance or rejection of some UPR recommendations gives a pretty good um, political signal as to the sensitivity of an issue and the capacity to engage. So again, um, although overall, and looking at China's overall cooperation with the UN human rights mechanisms, um, it is indeed hard to say that China is very cooperative, but when we break down a little bit and when we provide a little bit of nuance, we can identify some areas where this possibility of engagement at the national level. Um, now, another thing, of course, um, is again, engaging on this, on the recommendations um, that are deemed as more sensitive and perhaps here, the pathway of change, um, the channel to push for positive human rights change might not necessarily be um, available nationally, but it might be available internationally. And again, engaging with diplomats, um, engaging with UN agencies and other actors, thinking outside of the box, um, that could themselves either um, open, have a channel of dialogue with the state, or apply pressure on the state. Um, and this might contribute, again, often it, it is hard to map exactly um, how this event led specifically to this change, but it's important to understand that the UPR also contributes, it's one of the key elements that contributes um, to human rights change overall with other factors too. Um, UPR is also very important, not only um, to push nationally, and again, as we said, um, as an, a window of opportunity to dialogue with other states, but it is also um, a mechanism that can be uh, mutually reinforced with other UN mechanisms. Other UN mechanisms, such as again, the treaty bodies or the special procedures, um, they um, also issue recommendations, but they have different mandates and perhaps sometimes the scope of their, of their mandates is different. In the case of the UPR, this might be an opportunity actually, and specifically because it comes from states and not necessarily the UN, um, to actually come up with recommendations that would have been much harder to get, for instance, from those other human rights mechanisms, and using this um, to actually connect um, and reinforce other mechanisms. Again, um, an example of this is um, the fact that since the UPR is universal, it is um, in terms of mandates, um, the only space where um, directly rights enshrined in the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights can be addressed um, for mainland China. As for Hong Kong and Macau, uh, the covenant um, applies in, in, those, in, those, in those regions. Um, lastly, um, it is also important to keep on using the UPR as a tool not only for engagement with states, but also for engagement um, with other actors. There are also um, very interesting examples to engage with UPR, for instance, with businesses um, as, the, um, as many recommendations relate to the responsibility um, of um, Chinese companies operating overseas. And of course, this entails um, extra territorial obligations of the state um, to prevent um, any violations by actors under its jurisdiction um, abroad. But also, this might open a window of opportunity to directly dialogue with those um, companies. And here again, the, the channels of dialogue are, are different and the pressure points are different. And these are also spaces that could be interesting to engage, uh, to engage in. So I think here, in a nutshell, it's just important to consider that um, to think broadly and to think creatively about the UPR process, and not only just in terms of obtaining a, a, a strong recommendation that is accepted um, to then pressure the state with it. There are a lot of different ways to work around the UPR um, that are also very strategic uh, and that make it very important um, for, a, for civil society participation. Um, and I don't see any more questions. And just for a wrap up, I would like to, I would like to emphasize um, again that 
the UPR process is important also not only for what we can achieve from it, but again, to make sure that this is not only a state-led process and this is not only a completely political process. It has a part of political, of course, because this is um, in the end states or governments issuing recommendations to other governments. So of course, this means um, a certain level of other factors that are not only just related to um, the evidence of human rights violations, um, but there's a lot of space for civil society and this space uh, should be occupied and this space should be really, um, should be really reclaimed by civil society. Um, so basically it is important again that information is balanced, um, that civil society becomes and is and maintains its important role in the process. Um, well, I didn't see any more questions, but uh, I would first, of course, uh, like to thank everybody who was able to join today and for also your very insightful questions either now or sent um, before. Um, again, reiterating that um, we're really looking forward to seeing the ways in which you are able to use this, um, this new tool. Um, of course, seek your support in um, disseminating this tool as widely as possible with anyone interested um, with um, inside China or outside China uh, among your networks and local communities. Um, and, um, and again, we're open to discuss and to engage and to know a little bit more your plans for the midterm reporting looking ahead of 2023. And again, reminding ourselves that this comes fast. The midterm report is an important stage. So we should, uh, we should get back to work um, very soon. So thank you very much on behalf of ISHR, and I wish you all a great day or afternoon. Thank you.